Welcome to this webcast about the parasha. Now, before I start, I just want to say one or two things about the parasha. The division of the first five books of, of the Bible, or as we call it, Torah, into what is today commonly known as the parashot, or these portions, is not a new thing. When we read the New Testament, we see that Yeshua already, according to that system, read in the synagogue in Luke uh, when we read about him being in Nazareth. So this is something that already existed in the time of Yeshua. And according to what we understand is that this division of the um, Old Testament or then specifically the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, that this was already introduced in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And Ezra gathered a number of people together. If, um, we read about, um, about 80 plus of these names of people who came together in the book of Nehemiah. And the idea behind it was that never again should they be in the place where they are removed from the temple and not hear the word of God. And so what they did was they introduced a reading system whereby initially it was so that they had to read through it in a three-year period, then again a three-year period, and then in a Shemitah or a Shabbat year, which this year is a Shabbat year, they would read through it once. Or in, in, in one year, they would, would complete the, the whole cycle. So you have a triennial cycle, triennial cycle, plus an annual cycle. So that gives us seven years. And in those seven years, they would then read through the Torah three times because there is a very strong connection in Jewish thinking that the Torah has to be resurrected and that no more than three days or three years should pass unless it is resurrected. In other words, therefore, they had to read it in, in a, at, le uh, at least in a three-year time. But then during a seven-year cycle, they also had to read it three times, which means that the Torah would be resurrected. Or that's, and that's exactly the words that is used, that it would be resurrected not less than three times or in three days. Um, that's the, the, the concept behind it, which is very wonderful when you look at that. Now, this week we are reading the ninth Torah portion. Um, in the 12 Torah portions that we have in Genesis. Now the question is, how did they divide it? They didn't just divide it and say, okay, let's take all of the, the verses of the Bible and then um, divide them in equal numbers and there we have the Torah portions. No. What they did was they would look at the beginning and the end of every Torah portion because the beginning of, the, uh, of a Torah portion and the end of a Torah portion has to have bearing on one another. And so to understand what the big idea of a Torah portion is, the, the main idea, the bottom line, as people would say, of a Torah portion is you have to look at the beginning of the Torah portion and at the end of it. And if you don't really know how to look for these things, you might miss out on it. I remember our rabbi used to, to speak to us and say, guys, you need to see the big picture because otherwise you will make the wrong interpretations of the Torah. Now, so let's get to this week's Torah portion, um, which is Vayeshev, and it's from Genesis chapter 37, verse 1, to chapter 40, verse 23. Now, let's just look at, the, at an overview of what is in this Torah portion. We, in last week, we saw in the Torah portion how Jacob now returned to Canaan. And he then first stopped in Shechem. And then after that incident 
in Shechem where the, um, uh, the brothers killed all the guys because of the rape of Dina, um, Jacob then moved on and then they had to stop over again in Bethel and God reaffirms to Jacob the calling, the vision of what he has given uh, Jacob. Then from there on now, we see how Jacob then moves on. And in this week's Torah portion, we actually see, he says, Jacob settles now in Hebron with his 12 sons. Because uh, remember in last week's Torah portion, we also read about the birth of Benjamin. Um, so in Jacob's mind, Joseph is his firstborn. Because the woman that he really loved was Rachel. And she's the, uh, she is, as far as he's concerned, his first choice and his first wife. Therefore, we also read in the previous Torah portions how she acted in that manner of being the wife who makes the decisions as to what should be happening in the house or not. Even Leah had to get her permission if she wanted to sleep with with uh, Jacob and so Joseph now treats uh, uh, um, sorry Jacob now treats Joseph the eldest son from Rachel as his firstborn this is perceived by the brothers as favoritism and we read about this multicolored coat that he makes him um, but then in this first part of it of, of the Torah portion, we also read about the two dreams that Jacob has. And Jacob now shares the two dreams, you know, about the sheaves bowing down and about the, the sun and the moon and the stars and how they bow down to him. And how he has a vision of God raising him up in a place of position where even his family would bow down to him. Now, this is very interesting because Jacob has a dream and Jacob interprets, uh, uh, not Jacob had a dream, Joseph had a dream and, and Joseph interprets the dream in a correct way. But the way that it's perceived by Jacob and by the brothers are not positive. It's in a negative way. He's not, they're not receiving this very well. And they're actually saying to him, so do you want to set yourself up as a ruler over us? They don't understand that it's God doing this. They think it's just Joseph who wants to do it. So then in between, we see how uh, Simeon and Levi, then again, we have Simeon and Levi here. Um, the two that were these two culprits in the previous parasha who killed all the men of Shechem seems like they were a bit violent um, and now they plot to kill him Reuben then suggests to them no let's throw him into the pit instead because J Reuben wanted to come back later and save him but while Joseph is in the pit there is this caravan of Camels passing with merchants who were Ishmaelites. Now, this is very interesting. They were Ishmaelites. Um, so, you know, this problem that, that um, was caused by Abraham with Ishmael and his descendants are still here. It's continuing to give them problems. So, what we see is that Judah then have Joseph drawn up from the pit and he sells him to the Ishmaelites. So they sit with a problem. What are they going to tell Jacob, their father? So what they did was they then devised this plan. They took this coat, this special coat. They dip it in blood um, and they told their father the story that Joseph must have been eaten by some wild beasts. Then we have in between also how Judah marries, and we read about the three children that he have, that, 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 that he has, 
Um, and the whole story about how the eldest one marries this woman by the name of Tamar, and then how Tamar uh, then doesn't have children uh, with Er, Er dies, it happens to the second son, and then Judah is reluctant to give her his third son, because two of his sons have now died child, childless. What Tamar then does is because Tamar believes that she should then leave a legacy for this first husband of hers and that there should be an offspring. She dresses herself up and, and the Bible translates this that she dressed herself up as a prostitute. But in fact, um, there, is a, um, uh, th there is a notion about this which is speaking about the Syrian bride. And the Syrian bride was one when she wanted to get married, she would dress her up as if she's a prostitute to make herself desirable for her husband. We actually had this the other day when we were in Shilu. There was a girl sitting there and she was all dressed up like this. And when we spoke to her, we found out that this was exactly what she was doing. She, she dressed herself up in this custom of what they called the Syrian bride because she wanted her husband to really desire her. Um, and so this is what Tamar actually did. He, she didn't go out there to look like a prostitute, and, and that's just it. And also when we look at how uh, Judah acted, he gave her certain gifts as if he actually made a wedding covenant with her. And then when he came back to search for her, she was gone. He then finds out that she's pregnant, and he says this, daughter-in-law of mine, must now be killed because she has dishonored the family's name. Then she produces the gifts and Judah admits that he was the one. And we see how two children were born from that. And one of them then is, it's a, a twin sons that were born. And one of them is Peretz. And Peretz is then also the one from whose lineage David comes. Um, which is the whole royal lineage of, um, of Judah. In the meantime, Joseph has arrived in, in um, Egypt, and um, Potiphar, who is one of the high-ranking officers in the court of Pharaoh, acquires him as a, as a servant or as a slave. And in this we see how Potiphar's wife then desires this young man, um, that is in their house and she lures him into her chambers and he resists and she then turns us around tell her husband that he wanted to uh, force himself upon her now a strange thing happens and this is that Potiphar must have believed Joseph and not his wife because he only puts him in jail because normally this would be punishable by death. So he doesn't kill him. No. He, um, he merely puts him in jail. And here in jail, or in, in the prison, we see how Joseph gains this trust and this favor of the jailers. They put him in a place of, of um, uh, authority in the prison. And he is favored uh, by his, his um, jailers to this position. In that time, we have two of Pharaoh's high-ranking officers who ends up in jail. The chief butler, or the cupbearer as we see, and the baker, the chief baker. And both of them have dreams. Um, and these Dreams, they then tell Joseph, first the cupbearer or the, the, you can call him a butler, tells his dream to uh, Joseph and Joseph interprets it. And because of the favorable way that Joseph interprets this, the baker says, okay, then I'll also tell you my dream. And he interprets that, but it was not such a favorable thing. The butler, and exactly as Joseph interprets it, 
the butler is restored or the cupbearer is restored in his position, but the baker is executed. And then we see it ends off by saying that the butler actually forgot about Joseph and he didn't do anything. Joseph actually said to him, remember me, and he didn't. Now, so that's the, the content of this whole parasha. But we now have to try and find out what would be the main idea of this. And the main idea of this parasha lies in the fact that in the beginning of the parasha, we see Joseph having a dream, which is wrongly interpreted by his family. And at the end of the parasha, we have these two people having dreams, which is correctly interpreted by Joseph. And so the main idea about this is that God still is in control of everybody's life in the fact that God has purpose and plans and that God comes and reveals that to us in dreams or visions or how he wants to come and make that real to us. Now the word dream in the Hebrew actually can mean to bind something or to fasten it also. Um, you can interpret it that way also. And so when having a dream, it's like seeing God's purpose and having that as something that's bound on our lives. What God's purpose is, is bound for our lives. But the problem is never the vision that we see that God has for our lives. The problem is never in what we dream. The problem always lies in how do we interpret it. And so the big idea is to say, what am I going to do to make sure that I don't interpret this wrongly? That I'm not going to, to put my own uh, feelings and my own ideas in front, like Jacob did and like the brothers did. When they heard the visions, they didn't say, oh, let's make sure what this is because God is speaking to us. No, what they were doing is they were seeing how this would affect their lives. And they looked at it in a negative sense because they looked at it from their perspective and not from God's perspective. And this is very important. In other words, we always need to make sure how we interpret, how we discern what God is saying. It's not the physical vision you have. It's not the physical dream you have. It's not the exact words you hear God speaking. But it's how you want to apply it. That's normally the problem. Um, people get prophetic words. They get all sorts of dreams and visions. And I don't want to say that every dream that you get is from God. That is also not true because we need to, all, we need to firstly discern, was this which I hear, heard, was this from God or was it not? That's the first thing. And once I know that God has spoken, once I'm sure that this is God speaking to me, then I need to discern what is he saying to me. Now, you know, we have three voices speaking to us always. Firstly, we hear heaven speaking. Secondly, we also hear hell speaking. But thirdly, we hear our own voice. Now, when we look at the, at the um, account of the creation, then we see on the first day it says, let there be light. But on the second day, it says, let there be a division between the waters. The waters in heaven, the waters underneath the earth, and the waters on earth. And water is a type and shadow of the word. And so we need to make sure that when we hear the word of, and when we hear a word, who is the origin of this word? And if I am sure that this is the origin, that this origin is God, then I need to say, okay, now Lord, come and give me the interpretation. Now we have a lot of of examples about this in the New Testament. One of the most wonderful ones of that 
would be when Peter was in the house of Simon the Tanner and he sees this vision of the sheet coming down with the unclean animals and then three times the sheet comes and in Peter's mind he's busy with something that he has to eat physically while God is actually trying to tell him something he's trying to say to him Peter these people that you look upon as being unclean the Gentiles I've also made them clean and I want them to be in covenant with me so go there now if God didn't use the example of the unclean and clean animals Peter might never ever have done that because in his mind he was fixed upon it that the Messiah that he now believes in is only a Jewish or a Hebrew Messiah so God will sometimes use ideas in dreams in visions in how he speaks to us and our problem is that we want to look at it from an earthly perspective and we want to interpret dreams and visions we want to interpret what God is saying to us from the position where we stand instead of looking at from a heavenly position from what God wants for our lives so this parasha and if you were born in the week that this parasha was read there's something strong prophetically about your life but there's also a warning in this that we should not take everything we hear and just make it or everything that happens around us as if this is now a voice from God no we are living in circumstances and we sometimes because of our own experiences will interpret that which we hear wrong that, therefore it's so important that we will also have people in our lives who are trustworthy and who can pray with us and who can walk with us in this so many times we think that we have all the answers no we don't we need one another and we need a joseph in our lives every one of us needs a joseph one that can from the outside look in at this that god has said to us but somebody who's looking to find god's answer and not looking it from their own perspective whereas when joseph had the dream his father and his brothers were looking at it from their perspective and not from a heavenly perspective not from what is is this that god wants and sometimes there's envy that comes into our hearts when we hear what God is saying to other people. You know what? God has got something wonderful for you. And you don't have to compare yourself with someone else. And you don't have to look at what God says to someone else and then build your life on it. No. God has got a vision. God has a dream for your life. Interpret that according to what He says. God bless you. We will speak to you again about the parasha next week.